Okay. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. So, well, in our last uh, talk of the session, the last <coughs> day, we are very happy to have with us uh, Akran Drubi from Vanderbilt University. And he will talk us about dynamical sampling, a source term inverse problem. Thank you, Akram. Okay, well, let me start by thanking the organizer for uh, organizing these terrific sessions the last uh, week and today, and the speakers for uh, very beautiful talks and uh, also this diligent audience who is staying here till the last talk. So um, uh, thanks, uh, everyone. So today um, I'm going to be talking about chemical sampling and a source term inverse problem. So first of all, let me say a little bit about dynamical sampling. So dynamic, dynamical sampling is when you have a function in say space and time, and you're uh, sampling this function uh, both in uh, space and time, space time samples, and this evolve, uh, and, and you, you want to basically recover this function or a function that is related to it. And that's in general what is a dynamical what is meant by dynamical sampling because you have a function that is in space that is maybe evolving in time and you take space time samples. And today, um, what I'll be talking about is so there are many problems really in that in that realm. Uh, today I'll be talking about <laughs> what I call source term uh, a dynamical sampling, a source term inverse problem. And uh, so basically, you you sample. Uh, a function that is evolving in time, and you want to recover the, the function that is driving this function uh, to evolve. So this is basically, and I'll explain that uh, a little more. And um, so this work has been motivated and many of the work in dynamical sampling has been motivated and uh, uh, by, by work of Martin Betterly, Yu Lu, and this particular work is motivated by uh, also some work with uh, John Bruce, uh, Jean Marie Bruce, uh, Pierluigi Dragotti, and uh, and usually they're working, of course, on this particular uh, talk will be on on source localization from sensing network. This is the kind of uh, what inspire uh, some of the work that I'll be doing, I'll be presenting today, and. Uh, my collaborator, uh, Kerry Cornelson, Ilya Kristol, and uh, Long Shu Wang are uh, the main uh, people that uh, for this work that I'll be presenting. Okay, so, well, I'm gonna start with a definition that uh, we have, I guess, uh, uh, say many, many times, but here just for notation wise. So I have script G, that's a frame of H, if we have this inequality where C1 and C2 are positive constants. And we have, you know, again, I'm sorry, if this is have been repeated many times, but this is basically the frame reconstruction using the dual frame or a dual frame. So I will be using that uh, during the talk and this notation, uh, script G for a frame in a separable Herbert space and G being countable set. Okay, so let me start by uh, telling you what the problem is. So we're gonna consider an abstract initial value problem. So you have uh, du dt equal to a, that's some operator, u, plus some forcing term that I'm gonna call f, plus some other term, uh, uh, forcing term that I'm gonna call eta. They are different, this is why I separate them, I don't put them together. So eta is kind of a Lipschitz continuous uh, function which kind of model the background source. So there's a, some sort of background source that's going all, all the time, like, I don't know, the average temperature going out, outside, average pollution outside. 
uh, F is actually uh, so so A uh, A is 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 uh, is some some operator that have a domain in in some Hilbert space H, um, and it generates a C zero semi group that we are going to uh, denote by capital T. And this other forcing function that is moving uh, basically uh, U is different from eta. It, it is kind of a burst like, which it is of this form. It's, at, it's kind of the burst at time t equal to tj and uh, some function f sub j which belong to some either uh, subset of H or uh, subspace of H. So, so basically, um, this is a problem that U is evolving in time under the action because of, of a source, two source term, one which is the usual background, another which is more of a burst-like uh, um, uh, source, source term. And uh, of course, what we don't know, we don't know the, the, the time of the burst. Those are unknown to us. Uh, we don't know capital N. It's not, in fact, that, that and we don't know these, these burst terms either. So those are known. We don't know also the, the, anything about, about um, this uh, Lipschitz uh, background source term, except that maybe it's, it's Lipschitz constant. So here is a problem that we consider. So we want to be able to construct a frame of H and we want to be able to find a time step beta in which, and we're gonna basically take the following measurement of uh, the solution U to this initial value problem. We're gonna sample at uh, and beta, so uniformly in time. And we're gonna take functionals like this. And those are our measurements, except unfortunately, these usually are uh, noisy. So this term here, right here is noise. This is our measurement uh, with time split beta. And this G is come from uh, this set that we wanna construct. And we want to construct these set G and the time, uh, time step uh, beta so that this from these space time sample, we want to be able to recover well, or at least have an approximation and a stable approximation our, of our burst term. So we want to be able to recover our burst term uh, from, from these measurements. So this is uh, the problem it's a constructive problem. Can we find uh, such a frame and such a beta? So before I go on, let me ask the audience, is there any question about what the problem is about? Okay. So it's, it's a dynamical sampling again. You can think of this as, as a heat equation for example, with some source term, some of them are, uh, that are background, some of them are burst. You can think of this, uh, this U is, is, is uh, say, um, some sort of um, pollution and suddenly you have extra pollution because of these, these, these burst term, but you have a background pollution and you wanna be able to recover where these burst and pollution occur, for example, uh, from these measurements. Okay, so, so what I will describe is actually an algorithm um, that will recover this. There are some assumption. The assumption is uh, we know the Lipschitz constant for the background source term which is capital L, let's say. And we know something about the noise. So we know that somehow when we sample, every time we sample, we get a, a little bit of noise, but somehow this noise is bounded by some constant that we call sigma. Uh, in our sampling. So this has to do with maybe the device is not perfect. There is a little bit of thing. And so this is, this is the, the noise um, bound and this is the, the, um, 
uh, Lipschitz background constant. So knowing these, I want to be able to find an algorithm and prove something about uh, uh, some guarantees, okay? Or finding the burst term. Uh, Akram, can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. So, so you, don't, you don't know eta, you don't know f. Do you know a? Yes, very good question. I do know, I do know a. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's very important. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I stopped thinking about it because we have a solved problem in which A is also unknown. I was thinking, can I make a problem which A, so I'll, in which A is somewhat unknown, but with some other. Okay, so but that's a very good question because we, there are dynamical sampling problems which A actually is unknown. But in this case, we do, we do know A, so we do know uh, uh, the, also the semigroup. So what I'm going to present now is two things. I'm going to talk about an algorithm. As I'm talking about the algorithm uh, of, of what we're going to try to do to discover uh, this function f or approximate this, this burst function f is, is uh, uh, at the same time, it will give you an idea about, about even how to prove. Uh, I will not give you the proof, but you'll see it, it's kind of comes out a little bit from, from the algorithm that I will try to, dis to discuss here. So the first thing that, I will, that we want to do is we're going to pick, and I'm going to, let, let's just forget about V being subset, uh, subspace of H. Let's say uh, V is all of H, doesn't matter. So let's pick uh, a frame for H. Uh, and and uh, then from this frame, we're, we're going to construct a, a, a bigger frame. So what I'm going to add to this frame for H I'm going to add another set, which is consists of the frame, all the el frame element, uh, but kind of pushed by the uh, semigroup uh, operator. I'm going to push this frame by t star of beta. Beta is a time step. So I take every frame in G and I push it by t star beta of G. So that's give me another vector. And I'm going to take the union of these two vectors. I'm going to call this is my new G. So I have a G tilde, which is a frame of all of H. And now I, I use this, this G as my new set. And, and uh, uh, here's what I'm, uh, I want to, to, to look at the measurements now that using this new set, this big set. So basically, I can't t equal to n beta, uh, okay, I make the measurement mn of g tilde, some vector in here, which is really uh, the inner product of my function u with g tilde. And I'm going to also make uh, a measurement uh, with this vector, t star beta at g tilde, which is this inner product. And if you write this inner product uh, or these measurement uh, using uh, basically the semigroup, you, you can uh, write this, ex this is the, just directly as this expression right here. Mm. Uh, let me see if I can. So you have this term right here, and this carries the, the uh, burst right there. And this term right here, which carries the background, and this term, which is basically has to do with the noise. The same thing for, for this guy. Again, you have terms that are uh, related to burst, this term, which related to the background, and this term, which is the noise of the measurement. And here is a, the, the main uh, thing. Okay, so how do I do this now? I'm stuck. I cannot move my, I cannot move to the next. Because you are in the writing mode. You have yes. to so what do I do? I need to get out. 
We just have to share again. Yeah, maybe this is what I have to do. Sorry. Um, okay. So let's see now. Great. So, so again, I have, you remember I have these vectors, a G tilde that I multiplied by this operator that the uh, T star of beta, and those are other measurement. And what is this? Thanks. Say again. Okay. So, so th this, this picture tells you a little bit what I'm, why do I, uh, why did I produce these measurements right here with the T star beta of G? Here is a picture that explain a little bit the idea. Suppose at time two beta, I'm gonna make the two measurement M2 of G tilde at position four, G tilde four, and M2 at T star beta G tilde, which is again at time two at position four, but with uh, T star D data. So I make these two measurements. That's how, why I constructed this big set. This measurement right here, the M2 T star beta G tilde really predicts what's gonna happen in the next time step. If there is no burst, then this measurement M2 of T star beta G tilde four is gonna be exactly equal or uh, if there is no burst or not exactly equal, but really close to the measurement at time step three using G tilde four. So the measurement here, the M2 T star beta G tilde predict the measurement here, M3 G tilde four predicted that is are gonna be equal if there is no burst. If there is burst, then these things are not gonna be equal right here. And, 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 or a, this difference can be large depending on, on the burst. And this is what we're gonna to try to find out. So if there is no burst between time n beta and n plus one beta, this difference is gonna be small. Otherwise this difference is gonna be large. And so we have to kind of a little bit estimate uh, this, uh, this difference. So again, we have the burst-like term, which is here, and we're gonna assume some sort of separation between uh, consecutive uh, 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 bursts. So Tj plus one minus Tj is bigger than some constant that's fixed. And so there are two things we need to choose now. Uh, well, one is beta. We have already chosen the, the frame. So we're gonna choose beta, but we're gonna choose it so that it's much smaller than this, uh, uh, this constant right here. So beta is less than gamma, little gamma over three. And this difference mn plus one of G minus mn of T star. So at time n plus one minus this measurement at time n is what I said should be roughly small if there is no burst within that interval of time. However, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna actually look at two, two intervals so, uh, of, of size beta, so two consecutive interval. And the reason why we do this is in some sense to kind of, it's a trick to kind of uh, use this Lipschitz constant uh, that, that we have uh, in, in, in the background noise. So instead of, if I, in, instead of taking two consecutive measurement, I'm gonna take the difference between two consecutive measurements in two intervals that are side by side. And this is what we're doing here. And this is a trick to be able to get this inequality right here. This inequality, if you look at the difference between this and that at time n plus one and n, if there is no burst in the interval of size two beta, must be bounded by this uh, constant, which some constant time the Lipschitz constant, capital L of the background noise, times some beta square, which is a time step, time uh, 
the norm of the vector G with which I, I, I sampled plus four times sigma. So you can do this calculation and this is what you get from when you compute this, this guy right here. If there is no burst, then this difference must be small. And so that means that to, to detect a burst, we're gonna declare that we have a detection of some burst if this difference is sufficiently large. So if this difference is larger than some uh, k bigger than one time this, which, what, which is gonna be the threshold, we'll, de we'll declare that we have a burst in the interval n beta to n plus two beta. And, and there is a way, of, now we have to be able to distinguish which, which interval uh, n, n to n plus one beta or n plus one beta to n plus two beta where the bursts occur. And we can do that. I'm not gonna go too much into the detail, but we're gonna now say we're gonna, we will find the value essentially, or an approximate value of this, the inner product of, uh, of our burst, if it exists between this interval, by saying this value is of this functional, or this, this number here is gonna be the difference if we pass a threshold between n plus one and n, and n plus two and n plus one, this threshold that I showed you before. If this difference is large enough, we're gonna give a value, we're gonna say there is a threshold and this is the value, and this is gonna be essentially that. And if otherwise, if any of these are small, we're gonna say, well, we, there is no uh, 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 burst in this interval and we're gonna be zero. So this is basically the algorithm that we will, will we come up with. And of course, that already can tell you that we, with this, we will be able to recover approximately what F is. And, and so roughly speaking, under the assumption that we have here, there are some extra assumptions that I didn't put in the theorem here, but it's not, not that crucial. The important thing is to say that this function can be approximated uh, from this technique of measurement that I told you uh, in a way in which I know that if there is a, I will figure out all the bursts and the time of the burst within a, a, a time scale of beta over two. Beta is something I can choose. So I can choose as small as I want. And <coughs> I'm sorry, and this, um, once I, if I find the burst, which is basically when this, uh, when this is large, uh, then I know that in that interval, the difference between, I can reconstruct, if you like, my, my using, using the frame, some approximation of this guy. And now the difference is gonna be essentially related to uh, the Lipschitz constant, which is here, time beta square. And this is due to noise. So, so uh, the smaller the noise, of course, is the smaller this is gonna be close. And, and this constant d beta, which can go to zero under the right circumstances, for example, if t is uniformly continuous or some other conditions, we can make, we know that this, this constant here go to zero as beta go to zero time the value of of d. So this algorithm, roughly speaking, given uh, a burst-like ter a, a burst term that's buried in some background and that measured by some uh, noisy uh, device can still be recovered with this kind of uh, guarantee. And this is, uh, I think, uh, almost all. Uh, there is another algorithm which also is predictive that we have. It's a little bit more, uh, it's required different uh, kind of measurements and uh, um, it requires some sort of um, 
Fourier measurement uh, at various frequencies, and uh, and the prediction is a Prony-like uh, prediction. And uh, so with this algorithm, what we can gain, it's a little bit more complicated, but what we can gain is that our estimation of the time where the burst occurs is actually a big O of uh, beta square. Well, here is just half of the sampling size, the time, time sampling uh, step. And so this is all I really want to say. And uh, I just want to give a few, um, uh, references on on what what uh, uh, motivated us, and uh, uh, so there is this uh, these four the uh, more of these papers, of course, but these four papers are essentially deal with problems that are very related to what I just have uh, presented here. And with this, I would like to thank all of the participants and. Uh, I will uh, stop here and uh, take any of your questions. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Akram, and uh, very nice talk. And thank the speaker. So this is the uh, end of the session. So on behalf of the organizer, I want to thank all the speakers for the great talks, really great. And all the, I, I, I hope that the people that attend enjoy these talks. And um, I think um, one quick Akran to, to say something about the new journal that is uh, coming. So before you leave, uh, just uh, Akran, if you want to say. Yes, yes, thank you. So uh, I thought this would be a, a good time perhaps to, uh, to tell you about a journal that's really is a journal for this community. And so let me uh, simply try to uh, 